her in a little bit, um, but I just want to introduce myself. Um, I'm Connor Ressler. I'm the Chesapeake Conservation Corps member here at the Department of Public Works. Um, so I work along with uh, Louisa Robles and Aaron Josephitis on a lot of our environmental and sustainability initiatives. Um, so I wanted to welcome you to our Green Yards and Gardens workshop. Um, this will be a great chance for everyone to kind of identify some great ways to um, improve on your yards and gardens in a really sustainable and environmental um, friendly way. Um, so I just wanted to get started on the <laughs> Department of Public Works in case you've never been here before. Um, so this is, um, we're located here um, right at Buddy Attic Park and we do um, a lot for our physical infrastructure of the city. We um, maintain, preserve, and improve the physical infrastructure. Um, so that includes all of our roadways, our bikeways and walkways, um, all of our garden patches where we plant flowers, our garden beds, um, all of our trees are maintained here um, by people who work here at Public Works. Um, there's also a lot of environmental initiatives that we handle, including um, rain barrels, recycling and refuse pickup, and um, compost bins, which we'll talk a lot about today. Um, we also are um, Greenbelt a Sustainable Maryland certified community, so we provide a lot of these opportunities for citizens to get involved with our environmental and sustainability events. Um, for instance, today we're having a zero waste event, um, so please help yourself to our reusable coffee mugs um, and our compost bin in case you have anything that's compostable, as well as our recycle um, and our trash bin paired over here. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for coming out today, um, and I'm going to get started with our presentation. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of some of the topics we'll be talking about today, a little roadmap to what we'll be talking about. Um, we will start with some water conservation in your lawn or garden, um, and then talk a little bit about the use of native plants and really why they're an important aspect to um, your garden here in Maryland. Um, as well as some tips and um, importance around using pesticide-free techniques when you're sustainably gardening. Um, and then I'll end with a compost 101, um, just a quick preview to um, understanding why compost is important and kind of the methodology um, before um, we get into an opportunity for you all to purchase compost bins if you would like to from the NIE Institute. Um, any questions before we get started? All right, perfect. All right, then I'm going to dive right in. Um, so we're going to talk first about water conservation. So um, much of your water use in your house is actually used outside to irrigate your yards and lawns and gardens. Um, so it's really important to consider ways that you can um, improve and conserve on your water bill because it really helps out um, both to cut down on that water bill and also protect the environment. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about the problems that you have with turf when you're trying to conserve water. So um, I think a traditional lawn, that idea of like green grass all year round um, actually uses a lot more water and a lot more maintenance than is environmentally friendly. Um, so because grass has these shallow roots, they cannot soak up the water, so they require a lot more irrigation and a lot more water use than other types of plants. Um, there's also um, a lot of issues with compaction. So when you're um, mowing your lawn or have a lot of heavy foot traffic on your grass, it actually compacts the soil. Therefore, water cannot infiltrate and get down, and it ends up running off the lawn, much like it does a, a driveway or a roadway. Um, so when you have a compacted area that requires a lot of water with those shallow roots, you're actually using just a lot more water that ends up running off the lawn and not actually impacting the garden. Um, so it requires frequent irrigation and requires frequent, frequent treatment. So things like fertilizers, pesticides, um, and a lot of input and maintenance just to keep it green all year round. Um, so what we end up usually having is actually something much like the top picture where there's patches where it's become degraded, it's become eroded, um, and you're not getting that nice pristine turf that you would appreciate normally. So. Um, the number one thing you can do to kind of conserve your water is just to limit the amount of turf that you have in your yard. Um, so using it really only where it serves a purpose, like maybe like a play space or something where it actually um, is able to kind of stay green all year round. Um, but if you don't have a space like that, you can utilize it with different materials. So instead of having a turf, you can um, cover other areas with a mulch that really helps to keep the soil in place instead of washing away. Um, using um, like some other type of ground cover, some native plants or shrubs. Um, or some kind of permeable pavement. So if you wanted some kind of um, patio or something like that, making sure that it's, um, water can infiltrate it better instead of running off, because we all know that um, runoff creates a lot more um, local waterway pollution. Um, so it's a really great um, option to just remove that turf if it's not being an essential function. Um, and if you do have turf, it's really good to use um, these water efficient grass varieties for our local climate. So here in Maryland, we're in what's called a climate zone, usually seven about this area, which means that there are certain temperature and um, rainfall amounts that means that you can actually pick your turf 
um, based on the climatic area that we're in. So you can choose a um, graph that's more native and will actually be able to stay green a lot longer. Do you have a question? Would this um, PowerPoint be available online or some place for us to refer to? Yes, so like I can have two options. One is that it's actually being recorded and it will be available um, through the communications department. And I can also email this PowerPoint out to everyone who signed in today. So you have plenty of opportunities to go back to this information. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. I've seen some people using like a gravel yes. or stone. Mm -hmm. Is this also acceptable? Yeah, so xeriscaping is when you're using um, kind of a gravel or stone landscape. Um, but what's great about that is instead of using a lot of water, it allows that water to actually infiltrate into the ground. So that's almost like a permeable pavement kind of structure where you're using that um, instead of plants. So that's, that's a great option if you have an area that's hard to keep plants alive. It's not like really infiltrating a lot of water. You can use xeriscaping as an option too. Any other questions? Perfect. Um, so in this climatic zone, there are several types of grasses that are really beneficial to use um, for this part of the state of Maryland. Um, so we have like this tall fescue type grass um, and several other options that I've listed here on the sides. Um, but really the best is like a mixture or a blend of grass types so that you're not relying on one type that would only survive in one climate, but with a lot of variation with rainfall and temperature, you're kind of covering your bases to have a mixture of grass types. Um, so if you're in the process of trying to like plant a lawn or something with grass, um, definitely consider um, using this types. But I think most of us here have an established yard system, so this isn't always the most helpful to think about. Um, so we can also think about how we're maintaining our yards and gardens and really putting plants in the right spot. So instead of planting with just turf, having a variety of plant types can really help you to conserve water because um, where you are in your garden will need different types of water. Um, so you can group plants with similar water needs together. Um, so if you have like a turf or certain types of like water loving plants, putting them close together, close to the house, means that you won't have to extend that hose quite as far, it means that you only have one part of your lawn or your part of your garden that will require you to water it that much. Um, and then um, putting other types of plants in other parts of the year. So having trees and shrubs grouped together because they require a certain amount of water, and then those dr drought tolerant native species um, in another part. So you're not putting the same amount of water in all the same amount of places, if that makes sense. Um, and then plant, watering your plants accordingly. Um, so you, with those high water needs closer to your house, you don't have to extend that hose quite as far. Um, you're limiting the amount of non-natives and those ornamentals because those require a lot of water. So really being smart about how you're planting your yard or planting your garden um, will be able to save you a lot on your water bill. Any questions about that? Cool. Um, but the most effective way to save water is irrigating efficiently. So that means that you're using only as much water as is necessary. I think most of us will use a lot of water, which actually ends up running off of our lawn and isn't quite as necessary, and you're just wasting that water. Um, so you should have a customized system if it's at all possible. Um, and if you think about how your yard is placed out, if you're grouping plants together, it makes it much more um, easy to actually customize that system. Um, and to think about that system all throughout the year. So in the winter versus the summer, you're going to have very different water needs for types of plants. Um, and so it's really good to think about how that changes throughout the year um, in a drought time versus when it's really wet in the spring. Um, and to minimize evaporation. So it's really good if you can, if you see in this picture, have a drip or a soaker hose. Um, that means that you're not having as much water actually sprayed on top of the plants where it will evaporate out, but it's getting into the root and it's getting down and only using as much water as is necessary um, to water your plants. Um, and operating it in the cooler hours, so early in the morning or right at the evening, um, when the sun's not out and it's uh, causing a lot of that evaporation. Um, so that's a really good um, idea, is just to minimize the amount of evaporation, because then you're not using as much water, you're able to conserve it. Um, and then consistently checking for those that leaks, those broken heads, and those um, misdirected water. You want to make sure the water is actually getting to the place where it needs to go. Um, and then just a tip if you have a turf type, is um, infrequent deep watering encourage root growth. Um, root growth. So instead of um, watering all the time and watering just a little bit, when you um, do it more sparsed out, you're actually encouraging the roots to grow a little bit deeper. So that's a tip if you have a turf type um, lawn to actually encourage the roots to grow and that way they will use up more of that water. Any questions about that? Yeah. If you water at night, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't that promote, promote uh, diseases? So you definitely want to make sure that you're only using as much water as is necessary because you don't want to have water sitting out and that's um, when, 
Yeah, yeah so definitely. It sits overnight in the soil. Roots aren't necessarily taking it up as fast as they would in the sun. Exactly. So we encourage in, in the morning and the evening when the sun is still out just a little bit, but um, definitely it's better than midday to do it in those later times. Yeah. And the possible disease issue, mm -hmm. it's better not to use one of those shh spray things, but just use a hose at a lower rate that you pull directly at the roots. If you're going to walk around, it's really, it's not really the water on the leaves that yes. would encourage that. So put it directly to the soil. Right. It's well mulched. And Exactly. Something like a drip irrigation or where you're getting at the soils where the water needs to go. So yeah, if you don't want the water to sit on top of the leaves, that's where you can start to encourage that disease to happen. Any other questions? Right. Um, another great option for irrigation is to consider a rain barrel. Um, so for water conservation, this is great because you're actually just using free water from the rain. Um, so what this is, is it connects to your downspout, so all the water from your roof will be directed into a rain barrel, that then you can use the um, hose connected to the rain barrel and use that rain water at a later date. So this helps to mitigate pollution because normally that water would rush off and ru take some soil with it into our local waterways, but instead you can actually use it to actively water your gardens and conserve some of that water. Um, so there is currently a discount through Prince George's County's Department of the Environment. Um, through March 18th, you can order a rain barrel from this website, rainbarrelprogram.org forward slash greenbelt. Um, and it's only $75, but with the rain check rebate that Prince George's County offers, um, you can get all of that covered. So you're essentially getting a free rain barrel from the county um, that you can pick <coughs> up on April 1st. Um, so I definitely encourage you to take part in this. Um, you have like about one more week to get in that order, um, but it's a great opportunity to get a really discounted or free rain barrel from the uh, county. Yeah. And I just ordered one. And mm -hmm. I noticed the um, on the, the pickup event. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's um, maybe a possibility of a carpool forming. I don't have a car. Okay. Well, we could. Um, I need. I need. I would need help, obviously. It's be a long walk. <laughs> okay. Well, we um, encourage. Is there a Facebook event for that? Oh, sorry. If they could form a carpool for the pickup event? Um, some, some way to transport is, um, you can try asking your neighbors or friends. Um, there's some people that are going to be on the road. Is anyone going to, or, you know, I'm sure there's, if they can hook up, if somebody has to pick up one, they can pick up two. Yes. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, so Green Belters, Green Belters Community, or the Facebook page has a great opportunity to look for a carpool. There's also a grant through the county. There was just an email sent out uh, for uh, senior citizens needing landscaping help. So reach out to the Prince George's County Department of Environment. There's grant money available. I'm not sure if it would qualify for installing or picking up a rain barrel, but I can see how you could try to convince them. Call 311. Do you still have um, 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 approval required for where you locate the rain barrel? Are you in GHI? No. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So GHI has approved this use. They of, did? Yes. I think so, right? I don't know. I haven't heard. Do you hear? No. Ha. Uh -huh. So we, we um, showed the barrel to GHI so that they could pre-approve it so we don't have to go and ask permission to the board. Uh, we will, even if they do pre-approve it, we would still um, to write the form to, because they have to make sure that it's properly installed. Yeah. So, but if, if it has not been pre-approved, then we need to go talk to the board and ask them to approve it for each of our own houses. Um, Yes. Does somebody help you install it? So they have an in installation demonstration. Um, okay. So it's minimal um, installation where you really just need to redirect your downspout. Um, and so you, they actually have stuff at Home Depot that's like really cheap connection. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the only installation. The barrel comes almost ready to go with all of the materials provided. And they will have a demonstration at the pickup. Um, but hopefully it's really minimal um, so that you could figure it out and have your neighbors help you. Do you know if you actually need what kind of car? I mean, I have a car, mm -hmm. but it's just a sedan. Yeah. So yeah. I, don't, I don't even know if I could transport that. Mm -hmm. I don't have a truck. I don't have an SUV. Yeah, they, they said on the website that if you have a regular sedan, you'd be able to get it in the back seat. Okay. Not that big. Yeah. Do you have a barrel here? Um, it's, 
Is it around there? Yeah, if you want to go look for it, that'd be great. Yeah, and you can see how big it is. We have a demonstration one to see. Any other questions about the rain barrel event going on? <laughs> All right, well, we'll circle, circle back if we're able to find that. Um, another great way to conserve water is to use mulch on bare soil or um, areas where you're trying to discourage weeds. Um, so a thick layer, about three inches, insulates the soil, protects water, um, prevents evaporation. Um, and then also if you're using in, like an organic mulch, like tree bark or compost or leaves, it will actually enrich the soil over time and prevent diseases. Oh. All right. Yeah, question? Doesn't mulch run off when it rains, or do you have to have it? A thicker layer kind of prevents that so that <coughs> water will actually infiltrate it, um, but it also prevents the soil itself from running off. So it's better to have a mulch layer than to just leave a bare soil during rain events. Is it necessary to change the mulch every year, or can you just leave it and let it just decompose and add a new layer on top? I would encourage us to add new layers. Um, to check underneath the soil to make sure that there's not are underneath the mulch into the soil to check that there's not an issue, but I wouldn't necessarily think you need to remove that mulch. The mulch will degrade over time and actually become part of the soil that enriches it. What do you mean an issue? Issue? What, what issues? Um, in case there was any kind of like um, rot or something happening underneath, you just want to make sure that you're discouraging um, too much water from sitting there. And, oh, um, okay. But it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Yeah, so normally just adding mulch on top and maybe encourage, like um, fluffing it up a bit is best. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but also making sure that you keep it several inches away from tree roots um, and tree um, stems, or what's it called? Trunks. <laughs> to um, make sure that the trees are able to grow. So you don't want to cover trees completely with mulch. You want to make sure that those um, have a couple inches away. I've seen that, though, and uh, even over by the post office, mm -hmm. there's like mound of mulch around the base of the tree. Is that just a common landscaper practice or something? I'm not familiar if that's common. Um, we definitely encourage leaving some space for the tree roots. Yeah, I have seen it a lot. Uh, council complains a lot. They call it volcano mulching. Mm -hmm. yeah. And volcano mulching is not good for the yeah, trees. Yeah, definitely don't want to do that. Volcano mulch. They don't dig a hole deep enough, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you should donut mulch instead of volcano <laughs> <Right>. mulching. <laughs> yeah, so encouraging some space for trees and shrubs. Cool. Any other questions <laughs> on mulching? Yeah. Does the city of Greenbelt have any piles of Yes, we do. <laughs> or, or, or wood chips or something available? Yes, yeah, oh, so, Northway? yep, Northway Fields. And GHI has wood chips. Now they're fresh or, dig into it. or, 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 or rotted? So the Northway Fields is yard waste that it's um, decomposing, so it's turning into an organic mulch. Um, but the longer it kind of sits there, the more decomposed and the better kind of material it becomes. So there's lots of. It's a huge amount, definitely lots to take from um, Northway Fields. Um, and then GHI wood chips are um, shredded trees, so they're pretty right. fresh. If you do look to Northway Fields, um, there's these huge piles. Dig into it so that if you get to the interior part where it's really hot and dark, mm -hmm. that's yep. what you want. Don't take from the edges where it's like dry and cool and not fully cooked. Go a little bit deeper and get all of that good hot, steamy, dark stuff. That's good. And what about the wood chips? You know, I, I, I hesitate to use freshly chipped wood because uh -huh. it would draw nitrogen from the soil. But yeah. maybe again, is there an inner sanctum of nice there, wood chips? There's or what, pile, how would you Yeah, there's mitigate? a pile of wood chips up for grabs in GHI. That's behind the GHI main office. It's only open during their regular working hours. And um, they probably have different aging piles, mm -hmm. so you can go check them out and see if there are some that are sufficiently old that you would like to use. I know they've had the piles there for a year or two, mm -hmm. so some of the chips are newer and some of the chips are older. Right, but definitely encourage Northway Field. It's a great free resource for organic mulch for your yards. Um, and then just making sure that you're using appropriate maintenance on your yard will actually also conserve water. Um, so minimizing your fertilizer use, I think there's a tendency to add more fertilizer with the idea that it will do more good. Um, but actually most of that will run off. And not only are you wasting your money then, but you're also encouraging um, downstream pollution um, and eutrophication, which is um, when waterways kind of become clogged with nitrogen and then an algal growth. And then it just impacts the environment in a very negative way. Um, so only applying it where it's needed um, and just in a small concentration um, or a slow release formula for fertilizers. So definitely reading the label and finding out what's the appropriate amount for um, you to use. 
Um, and then if you have turf, mowing it higher in the, uh, excuse me, the warmer months actually encourages root growth. Um, so that's another way that you can kind of encourage that deeper roots to con um, save more water is mowing it just a little bit higher. Um, and then also weed maintenance is really important for you to conserve water. Um, so pulling weeds before they're able to kind of produce in seedlings um, and also covering with mulch to kind of prevent those seedlings from growing is a really powerful way to conserve water. Could you discuss any ways of uh, controlling um, Creeping Charlie? What was that? Creeping Charlie. Creeping Brown Charlie. Swedish ivy, oh. whatever you call it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's, it's really hard when we have invasive species encroaching into our yards. Um, my, my personal belief is that um, kind of getting them when it's early before they establish seeds is one really powerful way. Um, it requires, does require a lot of yard maintenance. Eradicate it manually? Yeah, you can't, you really have to do a lot of work to eradicate it manually. Yeah, um, but yeah, it will work. It will take a while to kind of get to that point where you're actually pulling it up and preventing seedlings. Um, but the more work you get in, hopefully over time it will dissipate. Um, does anyone else have a tip for, yeah? Relative to invasive species, mm -hmm. um, if I go to the website, can I find what the green belt code is? If you have a neighbor who has mm. lots and it's coming to you all the time, mm. is there any way to encourage besides talking to the person? If that doesn't work, is mm -hmm. there a way to encourage them to control it on their side? Louisa, do you have any? <laughs> Um, well, it depends if you live in GHI or if you live in a single family home. If you're in a single family home, then you'd have to talk to your neighbor and try to negotiate with them. If you live in GHI, there are certain plants that are forbidden. Um, so you can just, if the neighbor isn't responding, you can go talk to Joan Frog and then she can help you leverage um, the GHI handbook. But in the regular city? In the regular city home, then you just have to talk to your neighbor and say, you know, recommend what they can do. <coughs> um, yeah, because the city doesn't have an ordinance regarding different kinds of species of plants. Yeah, unfortunately, that would just be a neighbor to neighbor negotiation. Yeah, I wish we did, but um, unfortunately, it's kind of build that connection and it's much easier if we're all in it together. Yes, definitely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Definitely encourage them to drop off a pamphlet at their door about weed eradication. Uh, Any other questions about um, weeding, I guess, in general? All right, perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about native plants and really why they're an important part of um, yard and garden care. Um, so native plants have been in Maryland for so long that they are now adjusted to the climate. So they are used to the drought times, they're used to the wetter conditions, they're used to the temperature fluctuations. So they're gonna require a lot less input of time, a lot less input of water, a lot less input <coughs> of that fertilizer use because they're kind of established here, they know how to grow here. They're also much more deep rooted, so they're able to conserve water better than a traditional turf. Um, and they also provide a lot of um, great habitat for wildlife, especially pollinators, our birds, beads, and butterflies. Um, so <clears throat> for instance, we have our, our native Baltimore checker spot butterfly, um, our native um, oriole as um, birds and butterflies that really are impacted by having um, access to these native flowering plants. Um, so you're doing a great service to yourself as well as to the wildlife in the area. Um, so yeah, and it, it reduces the input of the water, the chemicals, and the amount of maintenance just because they are used to growing here and used to flourishing here. Um, so that doesn't mean they will have no maintenance. It still requires you to um, be able to kind of get out the weeds, um, to mulch around um, the trunks of them, um, and to really kind of plan out your garden when you're using natives, but it will reduce a lot of the extra input that you would normally have for those non-native plants that aren't used to growing here in Maryland. Um, so I definitely encourage you, um, I'm going to list some resources about native plants um, to look into some more of our region, but I'm just going to um, throw up a little bit of a list here for you to kind of get some ideas of what are native plants in this area of Maryland. Um, so for um, our grasses, sedges, and ground cover, um, I've just listed some of these ideas. So you can see that there's actually a lot of variety um, for some of our native plants here. Um, and I will send out this PowerPoint, so you definitely don't need to um, write down all these names. And I'll give out some resources as well for you to look at. Um, so any questions about this? But I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so wildflowers, there's lots of wildflowers that are native to Maryland, so you don't need to um, think about, oh, well, natives kind of are all weeds. There's definitely a lot of um, opportunities for you to provide color and to provide a really beautiful garden using native plants, um, including some of my favorites like Black-Eyed Susans, 
um, Joe Pye weed and then the cardinal flower really have a lot of bright colors that you can ornament your garden with. Is it the, uh, the Joe Pye weed? Mm -hmm. um, I have a neighbor from um, Newfoundland. Uh -huh. and <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't know how to pronounce it, so <laughs> could be Joe Peeweed. <laughs> um, but yeah, so definitely lots of opportunities, and these are what's great for pollinators. These are going to provide that beautiful habitat um, for our butterflies, our birds, and our bees. Um, and there's also several types of shrubs and trees that are um, native, so they require that less amount of water and less input of that maintenance um, that are also quite beautiful. Um, so some resources for native plants, I definitely encourage you to go on to the Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat for the Chesapeake Bay, which is by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's um, a document, I think it's available online for free as a PDF. Um, it lists some of those natives that you can um, access as well as um, what, how to use them appropriately and some of the maintenance around them. So that's a really great resource that I encourage you to look for online as well as the Chesapeake Native Plant Center. Um, it's a great website where you can um, kind of search for um, what you're looking for in your garden and they'll um, come back with some native plants for the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, also, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, or NOFA, has um, a beautiful kind of organization around um, using pesticide-free and fertilizer-free um, gardening and lawn care, so it's all organic, um, and definitely encourage you to look for that as a resource. Um, and if you're also curious about funding for some of these opportunities, um, Prince George's County has a rain check rebate program, which is what I was talking about with the rain barrel, um, where they will actually provide you a rebate for um, including some of these environmentally friendly and watershed friendly practices in your um, on your property. Um, so I've listed this kind of um, picture at the bottom that includes what the rain check rebate will cover. Um, so planting a tree or including a rain barrel or a rain garden or removing some of that pavement and putting in permeable pavement can actually be covered in a rebate. So I definitely encourage you to look into Prince George's County as Department of the Environment and their rain check rebate program through the Chesapeake Bay Trust because you can have a lot of um, great practices covered for you. Um, a cistern is similar to a rain barrel, but on a much larger scale. So I wouldn't necessarily think that a homeowner would look into a cistern. It just covers much more water. So instead of about a 50 or 75 gallon rain barrel, you would have like a 500 gallon rain cistern. Very, very, like a very well drum. Exactly. Yes, like a like a big like a yeah big drum for that. Um, so, but there's lots of opportunities for that to use that um, in larger scale. But for homeowners, I would encourage you to start with a rain barrel and see how that works out. Do you have a question? See a hand somewhere? All right, cool. Yeah, so I definitely encourage native plant use. I think they're a really powerful way to increase wildlife, but also in decrease the amount of maintenance that you need on them. Um, I encourage you to look at these resources. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about pesticide-free yards um, and really kind of the importance of not using pesticides um, and then some tips and tricks that are, pest that are um, not chemical-free in keeping out pests from your garden. Um, there's a lot more information on this subject than I'm going to cover today, um, or even that I know myself. Um, so I encourage you to look up some of these tips and tricks before um, going to look at chemicals. But um, just kind of talk a little bit more about the importance and some of the basics around this today. Um, so pesticides, um, chemical pesticides, I will say, like man-made chemicals, are not the best thing you want to be using in the garden for a number of reasons. Um, and the first is it damages pollinators in the environment. Um, so there have been multiple studies that show that pesticides, especially insecticides, where you're killing insects, um, can impact Maryland's native pollinators. So your butterflies and your bees are really being impacted by the amount of pesticide use. And it's not necessarily all homeowners. I think a large portion of it is also um, from larger scale agriculture and the amount of pesticides used there. Um, but know that um, even small parts that you can do to kind of reduce the amount of man-made chemicals you're using really does impact um, pollinators and impacts the environment in a larger scale. For instance, I've included this picture of a eutrophied lake. Um, so when you're using excess amounts of pesticides, it will actually wash off your garden when a rainstorm comes, get into local waterways, and increase the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen, which then um, causes algal blooms, um, which then um, kind of destroys the whole lake system. Um, so when you're decreasing <coughs> the amount of pesticide, you're decreasing the impact on the environment. I assume the same thing applies to herbicides. Yes, herbicides, insecticides, um, rodenticides, all kinds of like pesticides that you're using is um, impacting the use, of, is impacting the environment and is impacting pollinators. Um, and it's also a health hazard for you and your family and your pets. 
um, if you're using too much or even just using the prescribed amount, there have been serious health problems linked to over pesticide use. I have um, been known to use a, uh, a spray mm -hmm. to go after poison ivy. Uh -huh. I don't like poison ivy on my skin. Right. And um, it's pretty effective, but I just spray it a little bit, very light mist on the leaves. Yes. Poison ivy. Mm -hmm. When, if it rains, I have to re reapply it, but mm -hmm. um, assuming it doesn't rain, then in, in a matter of um, a week or so, the, the plant just shrivels up and just disappears. And that seems to be a pretty effective way of removing. I don't know a more effective way mm -hmm. by hand or not using the herbicide. Right. So th um, this is one. This is more of like a, an understanding and a theory around pesticides is to use only what's necessary. I think there's sometimes a tendency to use so much pesticides in a system that you're one, just most of it's going to wash away and you're wasting your money, but you're also impacting the environment. So my number one tip around pesticides is to read the label and use the amount prescribed. More does not equal more. Spraying more will not cause a better impact using just that little bit that you're spraying on the poison ivy leaves and doing it in a safe way that is on the label and using that prescribed amount is really the most beneficial way if you're going to use pesticides. Um, I'm going to go through some tips where you don't need to use pesticides, but there are cases, especially invasive species or poison ivy or something, where it may be not the best to pull off your hands or something. So, But if you are going to use a pesticide, I would say, A, it's your last resort and B, just to use only the amount prescribed as a little bit on only the prescribed area. Any questions about that? Cool, yeah. But also um, just knowing that if you overspray, you're not only impacting yourself, but also the environment too. Um, so it also leads to something called the resistance treadmill. So this term is thinking about how if you only rely on pesticides, especially like herbicides or insecticides, um, the more you use it, the more the environment will actually become resistant to it. So you spray a whole lot and then most of the insects or most of the plants die, but some of them survive and actually build up an immunity to it. So then they start to multiply. Now you have to use a different pesticide. So now you're spraying so much pesticides into the environment and things are still kind of becoming more resistant to it. So a more effective way is instead of using pesticide is to think about other ways to mitigate and keep in control of those pests without relying on something that they can become resistant to in the long term because then you're just providing more um, pesticides into the environment and you're not really getting anywhere. Um, you just keep going round and round and round in this loop until you run out of pesticides. So just something to keep in mind that even pesticides, as effective as they are, it can also things can build up a resistance to it. Um, and I just wanted to talk briefly about something I like to call like neonox or neonicotinoids. Definitely a big word, um, but it's um, something. It's a specific type of pesticide that has been recently, I want I'll say recently, decades old, um, used to combat um, um, insects. It's an insecticide, but it's a water soluble. Um, pesticide, which means plants will actually take it up for themselves. So there's um, been a huge push to use this in agriculture. Um, however, there's been lots of studies that are showing that there is an issue with pollinators being impacted by um, these neonox. Um, so they um, kind of become affected by it. And then there's been a lot of theories that this is linked to that like um, colony collapse with bees, the colony collapse disorder. Um, but what's really great for the state of Maryland is that they've actually been outlawed for sale. Um, so starting in January 2018, under this new law, um, effectively you will not be able to buy any pesticide with these neonicotinoids, um, which I've listed any of the chemicals that are, would be prescribed on the label. Um, but it's just good to know that um, there are steps in the state of Maryland to kind of reduce those um, negative impacts from pesticides, um, including this law, which will prohibit um, the sale of this starting in 2018. So um, something to just be aware of is something that neonox I wouldn't advise using it just because we want to protect our pollinators, but pretty soon they'll become out of use in the state of Maryland anyway. Any questions about that? Cool. Um, so I'm just going to now list some of these tips that I have. This is by no means a comprehensive list of pest control tips, um, but they're pest control tips that don't rely on those man-made chemicals, um, and they're things that you can utilize in your own garden. Um, and it really starts with prevention. Um, so instead of thinking about pest problems where you already have the pests, a lot of pest problems you can think about preemptively is how to prevent them from actually getting into your garden. Um, so the number one thing you can do is pull out any um, weak plants. So we say something that it looks like it's diseased, it looks like it might have a problem, is removing it 
before it becomes a problem and really pulling out a lot of weeds and a lot of um, dead or dying plants will prevent those from spreading to your other healthy plants. Um, also building a healthy soil. So if you have a healthy soil, it will actually be able to fight a lot of those pathogens, a lot of those diseases, and a lot of those pests for you. Um, so the way you build a healthy soil is making sure it has a, um, a rich organic compost source. So maybe you're using that Northway Fields um, mulch, maybe you're using um, compost from your own garden, but really building that soil up to be a healthy um, and disease-free will be able to prevent a lot of pests before they come into there. Um, Minimizing insect habitat, so where you're clearing out debris where insects would breed or mulching on top of soil to kind of prevent them from taking root um, is really important. So you're kind of clearing out things where insects would be able to breed. Um, and then keeping what we mentioned foliage dry, so you're not watering at night and leaving the water on the leaves all night, but you're just watering at the root and you're watering um, at times that conserves water but also doesn't leave water on top of the leaves for long term, because that's how you're kind of inviting diseases and inviting pests is by leaving water on them. Um, and then if you are um, using tools or something, disinfecting if you have an area that's diseased. So making sure that if you're working in one part of the garden where you've noticed there might have been a plant disease or something, or seeds from um, an invasive species, to disinfect and to clean your tools before you go to a new part of your yard, or you borrowed your neighbor's tools or something like that. So it stops the spread. Disinfect um, just washing it, even just a light, like a small bleach solution or something, but if you are working in an area um, that has a disease or has seeds from something, you just want to make sure you're not transporting that stuff. So nothing major, but just a, a gentle washing or a gentle bleach rinse will or disinfect. Alcohol. Or alcohol too. So lots of options. Um, and then rotating crops throughout seasons is also, if you're growing in a garden, can um, decrease the amount of pests where you're not growing the same patch over and over again year after year, um, but your rotating around will um, increase the um, ability for your soil to fight pests, where you're not in, like, having one pest come back continually because it will be moving around the system. Any questions about that? Um, and then I wanted to just list some beneficial insects, so a great way to um, include pesticide-free gardening, but pest prevention is to increase the amount of beneficial insects that you have in your garden. Um, so I'm just going to go through some examples, and of course there are many more that I encourage you to look at if you have a question about a specific pest. There will most likely be a beneficial um, insect that you can kind of encourage into your garden to fight that um, insect pest for you. Um, so for instance, ladybugs eat a lot of, um, of our pests like aphids and mites, um, and you can plant a certain type of flower from the carrot family. Um, like fennel or dill or um, even sunflowers to encourage ladybugs to um, come into your garden to fight those pests for you. Um, you can also kind of order them online or from a garden store. They can often provide you with ladybugs or ladybug eggs so that you can have them in your garden as a beneficial insect. Um, there's also um, lace wings, which are also kind of grown in those, those carrot family flowers or um, buckwheat and corn, um, and they will eat a lot of these different pests for you, um, also available at your garden store. Um, also, these big-eyed bugs um, will have <coughs> fight for mites and worms and flea beetles, um, and you can kind of grow them in some of your like um, clover crops that you would do in the um, winter months as a cover crop. So you can encourage them um, in the um, to come to your garden, um, as well as these um, wasp larvae, which um, will eat most um, caterpillar or most worm larvae. Um, then they will come in like nectaring flowers. So um, anything like parsley and fennel, um, sunflowers, it will encourage these wasp larvae to come and kind of combat caterpillars and um, worms. And then also praying mantis is a great insect and they're available um, through mail order. If you have a large pest problem, you can encourage praying mantis in your garden. Um, and then there's also nematodes, which is um, a beneficial kind of worm to your garden. Um, and it's a really effective against beetle larvae. So if you have a problem with beetles, in, um, getting these nematodes from, um, you can actually buy them from like garden supply stores and you set out a sponge um, and then they are incorporated into the soil to um, combat beetle larvae. So it's a really interesting way to do that. Um, and then one thing that could be of interest to you is a, a mini insectary where you're planting one portion of your garden with these flowers and um, plants that encourage the beneficial insects so that you'll have that benefit to your whole garden by planting this one portion with um, these beneficial um, flowering um, that attract insects. 
Um, any questions about beneficial insects? Cool. Um, so this is a lot of words, but mostly I'm just going to talk about some non-toxic solutions um, so that if you have a pest problem and you don't necessarily have a beneficial insect that you can kind of use these home remedies that are non-toxic to um, combat the pests. Um, so first one is if you have like, a problem with mites or aphids, is to mix a tablespoon of canola oil with some ivory soap and then put it into a shake bottle and spray it on your garden. Um, and the second one is if you have a problem with milky spore, is to um, get the, or uh, not a problem with milky spore, is if you have a problem with grubs, to get this milky spore. So it's from a garden supply store, um, and they're granules that you kind of spread into the soil that then combats things that are like soft-bodied insects. So. Um, Things like grubs and slugs and stuff will actually be um, able to be combated with this natural solution. Um, and then if you have other problems with insects, you can use um, hot sauce cayenne, spe or cayenne pepper and put it into a spray bottle solution. So I have lots of spray bottle solutions in here. I think you can also use uh, cayenne pepper to discourage squirrels. Yep, and so it's multi-benefits multi to problem. using that. Yeah, question? You keep saying ivory soap. Does it have to be a specific brand? No, I think ivory is just more on the natural side, so it has less dyes and fragrances, but um, I would just encourage any kind of, without too many chemicals in the soap. Yeah, but those spray bottle solutions can be a great way just to have that initial non-toxic solution without going to the pesticide straight away. Um, and so I list several more here. Um, I have this thing called dichotomous earth, which is um, a way that you can spread to get rid of slugs and snails. Um, there's also a baking soda solution in a spray bottle or milk in a spray bottle, um, as well as cooking oil and baking soda in a spray bottle with soap. And there's lots of different online sources like this. I'm just listing a few here, um, depending on the type of disease that you have. So if you're looking for more of a fungal um, pesticide versus um, an insectal fungal side or insecticide, there's lots of different options with these like home remedies that are non-toxic. Um, so I definitely encourage you to go online. I found most of these on a website called eartheasy.org um, or yeah, .org. So I definitely encourage you to do some research um, before you buy those pesticides because there's lots of non-toxic solutions um, to help you out. Um, and then also thinking about a way instead of having pesticides is to do some of these traps and barriers. Um, so if you're familiar with um, row covers um, as a way to kind of you Place, I have a picture in the middle there. You place this cloth over them so that water and sunlight can come through, but insects are not able to. Um, so you mount them with stones along the sides, and then they come in a variety of sizes, like you're buying cloth, essentially. And to roll them out over your garden is a great way to protect especially young plants um, to prevent them from having pests. Um, you can also use flypaper or pheromone traps. Um, so flypaper is kind of anything that's yellow and sticky that you can be able to stick in your garden will attract flies to it um, to discourage them in your garden. Um, and pheromone traps are pretty cheap and they're a way that you can get insects to come into the traps without having to use a pesticide. Um, so definitely lots of options for traps and barriers. If you're having a problem and not really sure how to combat that, there's lots of options for you. Any questions about that? All right, and then I've also just listed some deer control because I know deer can also be a huge pest problem. Um, but using most like an egg in a spray bottle um, with water um, discourages um, deer to come. So you kind of mix detergent and egg in the, with the water and spray it on there. The egg means that it will last through the rain and the detergent will discourage the deer from eating it. So what's great about deer is they're habitual eaters so that um, they'll usually come to one area. So if you discourage them to come from that area, they'll stop coming to it altogether. Um, and there's lots of non-toxic um, repellents that are also available at like home garden stores as well. Um, and if you have something that you want to, um, can also hang from your tree or something like that, soaps and human hair can actually be hung from trees and discourage deer because they don't like the scent of that. Um, so lots of options here for um, mammal control as well as insects and um, plant diseases. Um, and then also with rodents, the number one thing is prevention. So you're closing off containers of compost of garbage so that they're not encouraged to come there. Um, but then also using peppermint as a natural um, repellent of rodents instead of rodenticide. Good. Yeah. Okay. House cat can be pretty effective inside. So yeah, house cats are also great. <laughs> cool. So I've, I've covered most of my um, pesticide talk. I encourage you to look up. There's lots more options for pesticide-free yard. Um, but I'm going to switch gears right now to talk about compost. 
um, and really why it's beneficial to your garden is that you're not only saving those resources that would normally go to the landfill, um, which has a huge environmental impact of decreasing the amount of um, methane in the air, as well as um, problems with leachate and harming um, your health when you send food to the landfill, um, but it also will then create a nice garden additive. We talked about having a natural organic compost in your garden will increase the amount of health to your soil um, and will really prevent diseases um, and encourage growth. So this is a great way to use something that you would normally throw away and turn it into a great benefit to your garden um, through a number of means. Um, so just as a base definition, composting is the decomposition of plant remains and other things that were once alive um, into um, this dark, earthy, crumbly material that is great for your garden. Um, so it's really, like I said, a valuable way to turn waste into something beneficial for your garden. <coughs> um, and like I said, it's good for your garden because it can be used as a top dressing. It can also um, be used to really enrich your soil over time. Um, and it adds organic matter. So if you have an issue with the amount of um, water that your soil can hold, um, compost is great on both ends of it. If you have a really like sandy soil, it will um, increase the amount of water that your soil can hold. But also if you have a really clay type soil, it will increase the amount of water that will actually infiltrate into your soil. Um, so really it benefits all types of soil and there's really no type of soil that doesn't need compost. Um, and it also um, is a great filter for watershed pollution. Um, so this is a great way to kind of combat um, runoff from so, um, stormwater systems. So it really captures a lot of those toxins. Um, and it inoculates the soil with good bacteria. So it's a great way to combat diseases, including compost in your soil. Um, so essentially, the number one thing to think about with compost is that you're providing good habitat for microorganisms that will then do the work of breaking down the food scraps and the other materials for you. Um, so you're providing a happy, happy, healthy community for these organisms to do your work. Um, so you have to think about um, the needs of the microbes and really what are the functions that they need to live, which are air, water, and food. So as long as you're able to provide a happy, healthy environment for these organisms, they're going to do all the work for you and get that good compost at the end. Um, so now I'm going to go through and talk about how you get that air, water, and food to these organisms. Um, so the first one is air is that um, composting is an aerobic um, form, it's an aerobic process. Um, so it needs air to actually have that happen. Um, if you have an anaerobic process, it will still break down eventually, but it'll take a lot longer and it'll start to smell. So you definitely don't want to um, encourage an anaerobic process. So you want to encourage air into your system. Um, and there's a number of ways you can do this. One is to um, um, incorporate different layers of material so that you're having things with much more space between them so they'll have air continuously. And the other is to get in there and kind of turn it every once in a while and that turning will actually um, incorporate more air into it. We call it like fluffing it up. Whether that's like with a shovel or with a tumbler system, you're incorporating air into the system. I remember somebody recently who has a uh, amazing compost tip in her backyard. Mm -hmm. And um, she does a certain amount of turning herself, but one trick that I had never heard anybody else use I thought it was kind of funny. Um, she puts um, rotting pumpkins in there in the fall mm -hmm. when their farmer wants you to come and, and haul them away, please. Mm -hmm. And uh, squirrels apparently love pumpkin seeds and they will dig into the compost for them. So she has squirrels for employees. Yeah, <laughs> really, really smart. <laughs> Um, yeah, so definitely something to think about is that you can incorporate squirrels, um, although I encourage you to also think about keeping out other pests from that as well. Um, but another way to incorporate to get that air in there is squirrel workers. <laughs> um, so if you, um, so one way is that fluffing up. The other way is to put like newspapers um, or shredded straw or something. Those materials will keep a nice bundle of air so that um, microbes are able to still have access to that through the whole composting system. Um, so once you have a system where you're have air in it, you also have to make sure it's um, hydrated, it has water. So it should be, we call it the, the compost test, is where you kind of give it a little squeeze and it should feel about as damp as a dried out sponge. So if you have like water running down your arm, probably too much water, but if you squeeze it and it feels really dry and sandy, that probably means it's also too dry. So you want to make sure that um, you are able to provide it water in the really dry times, so maybe from a hose or from a rain barrel, um, but also making sure it's not too wet and that maybe you um, also have a cover for it if it becomes too wet of a system. Do you have any problem with peeing into your compost pile? 
I personally don't. I mean, it's a great way to kind of make sure that you're balancing the nitrogen and the water. Um, make sure it's in private, though. <laughs> yeah, so definitely one way to do it. Um, but just making sure that um, there's good drainage for it so that it's not just one part of the compost bin that's getting the water, but it will be able to kind of filter down through the whole system. That's also a good way to make sure there's air getting to it when there's that proper drainage as well. Um, but so you might need to add more water in the dry months, you might need to cover it in the wet months, but just making sure there's that balance throughout the whole year. Um, and so then food. So there's two types of food for your compost system. Um, one is going to provide the, the nitrogen and the nitrogenous materials, and one is going to provide the carbon. So I'm going to first talk about the browns, which provide the carbon. Um, so these are anything kind of like leaves, um, straw, wood chips. Um, shredded newspaper or shredded cardboard, you want to make sure that um, it's newspaper is soy based ink, so you probably don't want to have like regular printer paper. But newspaper cardboard, if they're shredded pretty nicely, can also be a great brown. Um, and there's this high amount of carbon in these like cellulose structure, these long chains, um, which means that there's good food for the uh, microorganisms um, to kind of have all year, all year round. They're going to have this balance between the nitrogen and the carbon. Um, but you want to make sure that these are also a great way that you can aerate. So definitely having um, browns is important in your compost bin. It's not just the food scraps. How much shredding? Like, does it have to be paper shredder fine, or can it be child labor fine? <laughs> I would say child labor fine is pretty good. Yeah. But if you're putting in a whole sheet of cardboard and expecting that to be your brown layer. Right, but like it, your newspaper. Yeah, newspaper is shredding it up. Just yeah, I wouldn't need to think it's super fine. But any mechanical labor you're doing is just helping the microbes out in the end, so they don't have to break that up for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So having the small pieces. Um, so having this important energy source is just as important as the, the food scraps that we sometimes normally associate with compost. Um, so on that note, the greens are the nitrogenous materials. So these are things like our um, plants from the garden that we don't aren't using currently, but making sure that if they are a weed, they haven't gone to seed yet. Um, but also um, our food scraps, like our vegetable and fruit peels, um, our eggshells, our coffee grounds, our tea bags, when they have the stapler removed from them, tea bags. Um, but they're having this high um, amino acid content, which is also good food for the um, microbes. So you probably want about an, in backyard composting, you want about an equal ratio of that C to N. So for every layer of greens you're putting, you're putting also a layer of browns. Um, did you have a question? I was just wondering, I use paper pellets for my cat litter box. Can mm -hmm. I use that as a new material? I mean, what I pull out of the litter box? Um, it's not recommended to use pet waste stuff because there might be pathogens there that don't get uh, broken down in the composting process. The type of compost that we have at home is not necessarily hot compost, so the pile won't get hot enough to kill all the pathogens. So it's counterindicated to use pet waste. Although, if you are able to make hot compost, like if you have a proper uh, four feet by four feet by four feet, and you're making sure the temperature gets really hot, then you could. Yeah. Also, you could just have a separate composter where you don't put that compost on, on your garden. Yeah, that too. And just use it only for pet waste. Right. Yeah. So that brings up an important distinction between hot composting yes. and cold composting. Yeah. Um, so cold compost, yeah, yeah, cold composting is what most of us would be able to do in our backyard, um, where it doesn't get up to a certain temperature, but it will still break down over time. Hot composting means you have about four feet by four feet by four feet structure, um, and you're kind of monitoring that temperature to make sure it gets up to a little less than 150 degrees Fahrenheit, because um, that way it's able to kill off those pathogens, and it will cook a much faster into a batch of compost. Um, so, but for most of our backyard, we will have an, that ratio between that carbon and nitrogen is about one to one. So you'll have a layer of browns, a layer of greens, a layer of browns, which will encourage aeration, will encourage good water use, but it also keep that ratio pretty stable. Um, so th just a good reminder of our browns plus our greens, and then adding that water and air will turn it into good compost because the microorganisms will do the work for us. Um, so this is kind of just a reminder of what should go in the bin and what shouldn't. Um, so putting in your fruits and vegetables, eggshells, coffee grounds, and then your browns, your wood chips, leaves, paper. Um, but you want to make sure that there's no weed seeds in there if you're using garden materials. 
Um, and then also just things to avoid is probably those meats, those dairies and those fats. Um, if you have a little bit, that might be okay to put in, but I wouldn't encourage putting in like a whole turkey carcass after Thanksgiving. Um, that's just gonna attract pests because it takes a lot longer to break down and that's what pests kind of smell and go for. Um, so I encourage more of the, the vegetative <coughs> food waste versus meats and dairies. Right, that crackers, that kind of stuff, um, attracting rodents, or would that, is that the reason why you wouldn't, like the dry, um, I guess bread products, like if you had like crust from your bread or like stale crackers would be okay to put in your compost bin. Um, if you were, are encouraging then a rodent problem, that might be what's attracting them, but um, <coughs> I wouldn't... I, wondering, would it, would it, if I wouldn't normally it, think that... Since it's mixed up with everything, it wouldn't. Yeah, right. mostly grain products would probably be more on that vegetative side. Do you need to put shells? I don't know, that's fine. I just toss them in. There's not a problem to have that. Well, any other questions on what should go in versus what doesn't? Yeah. Um, just a comment. It also depends on the amount. Like yes. If you have some bread crust or some crackers or and you're mixing them in, that's fine. If you have 20 loaves of bread that you put in there, then right. that's Not a like different story. Crust, yeah. But right. Same thing with the fats and the dairies. If you have like a little cheese crust or someone didn't entirely finish their hamburger or so, that's fine. If you have a huge party and no one ate their hamburger, and then to put all of that in there. So it also depends on how much. You know, a little bit, it's okay. A lot, then it wouldn't be recommended. Right, so keeping in size, like ratio and size of stuff, but yeah. mostly on the side of fruit and vegetables and eggshells, and then less on the side of meats, dairies. And does Green have those little tabletop or kitchen top boxes? No, but they're really easy to find online. Um, if you want an example, we have one over by our coffee machine. Um, they're really great because then you can keep um, like your kitchen waste in there and it doesn't smell, it has a nice lid on it. Um, and then when it's ready to go out into your, compo your larger compost bin, you can dump it. So definitely encourage, they're pretty cheap. You can find them online pretty easily. Look for like tabletop or countertop compost bins. Yes, the, the, yeah, yeah. the compostable bags yeah. that they have at Moms, you can use to line that. Mm -hmm. Or I, newspaper, too. Right. Newspaper. Newspaper. Any other questions about that? And then I just have some reminders of what not to compost. So chemically treated wood, the wood would then introduce chemicals into your compost. Um, diseased plants, um, as well as any of our weeds, because we don't want those weed seeds to then be encouraged to grow in our gardens again. Um, as well as any of those wet pet wastes, because we, if we aren't able to get it hot enough, then those pathogens will still be in the soil, which we don't want to introduce. Um, um, I have a project so, mm -hmm. of um, uh, um, edging and pulling weeds out of hedge, the hedgerow. Mm -hmm. My neighbor, who is in turn going to help pet sitting when I'm out of town. And um, some of those vines in there, I, I think, are those not acceptable for um, they're not. Some of them are not. So uh, English ivy, bamboo, and we have a list of things. Really thick stuff. Mm -hmm. You'd have to oh. see it, I guess, to know. Yeah, I don't know what it is. If it's an exotic invasive, the city won't want to pick, pick it up. It's certainly invasive. But if it's not exotic, then it might be okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you have like a, a native plant or a weed that hasn't necessarily gone to seed, you can put that in your yard waste. But if it's an exotic or something like that, like a English ivy, bamboo, you <coughs> want to send that to to the landfill. They don't want to turn that into compost um, that would then put on gardens. Any questions? I frankly don't use any plant from the end of the garden season. I just yeah. I would rather get rid of all of those. You yeah. Know, just you just don't know, right? In October, those tomato vines and peppers, I just don't trust them. Yeah. It's smart. Err on the side of caution. You don't want to introduce those seeds back into the garden. Um, and then this is a helpful reminder of things that are those good browns and greens versus things that you want to avoid or only have a little bit of in your compost bin, except for weeds, no weeds. Um, so the ideal size of a compost bin is about um, a cubic yard, so three feet by three feet by three feet. Um, what's great is the compost bins that we're selling meet that structure. Um, but there's a huge range in the size and the styles of your compost bin, so definitely don't think that like, oh, this one didn't necessarily work out for me, so I'm going to be turned off for compost, or my neighbor had an issue, that there's lots of different types um, that really function best for both aesthetics and for functionality. 
Um, so, and really be thinking about the materials that are going to go in there. If you have mostly kitchen waste, um, thinking about ones that would be best for you versus other types of waste. Um, and what's also going to fit in your GHI home is also a good consideration. <laughs> um, so there's several types. We have like pallet systems where you're um, then able to close it off from pests and from the rain um, versus more open systems where you're kind of just using a wire mesh to keep the materials in there. Um, what's great about this is you can kind of see as the layers build when you're ready to take out the bottom layer. So when you're building a compost system, newer stuff would go on top. So the more um, decomposed stuff would be on the bottom so that when you're ready, you can actually kind of open it up, scoot out the stuff from the bottom, and then put the stuff from the top back on there to compost some more over time. Um, and these ones kind of allow you to see that a little bit better. Um, however, there's also ones that you can purchase, like these enclosed ones that we have for sale today. Um, also, we're selling them next week. Um, but what's great about this is they have a little door on the front there so that you can open it up and see on the bottom when the compost is ready to be taken out into your garden, and then a lid on top for you to add new stuff. Um, but it kind of keeps it, um, we're selling them for $30 to Greenbelt residents, um, cash or check. Um, but um, what's great is then this is closed off so you don't have a pest problem, but it's also kind of exposed on the bottom so that you're incorporating good microbes from the soil into this. It's not a closed off system. Um, and like I said, the pile, it, it layers over time, so you would pull it out from the bottom and then keep the stuff on top to keep cooking longer. Um, but it's good to have something with a door so you don't have to dig to the bottom. Um, and then if you wanted a hot compost system where you're getting that four feet by four feet by four feet and are getting it up to the right temperature, um, something like a two or three bin system um, where you move the compost over time from the first one into the second one and then in subsequently into the third one um, so that over time you're getting good compost in distinct systems. It's, it's an option, but definitely probably not for backyard composting. This is a bigger operation. Um, and then you know when your compost is ready, when it um, kind of has that dirt, uh, that dark, crumbly look and smell to it. It really smells earthy. It doesn't smell like it's still processing and cooking. You can kind of smell. It smells more like soil and less like food waste. Um, you can't really tell what the original parts are. They're broken down, so they really have the look and the feel of like this earthy, mulchy stuff. Do you recommend screening compost for garden? Definitely for some of the materials that you have in there. If you're incorporating a lot of wood chips or a lot of um, bigger pieces of material can be good to screen out. Um, kind of depends on the size of your operation and what you put in there, but it never hurts to screen before you put it on your garden. If you're still not sure if your compost is ready, you can grab a, a small amount, put it in a Ziploc bag, let it sit for a week. After a week, open it up and smell. If it smells earthy, it's good to go. If it still smells like it's decomposing, then let it sit a little longer. Yep, so another great test to see if your compost is ready. Um, there's also a compost opportunity if you are someone who wants to get involved with this but doesn't necessarily have their own bin or is interested in that. Um, Cheers, the Chesapeake Education Arts and Research Society, um, has the Three Sisters Gardens, which all have compost bins, and they're starting this pilot program um, for interested families throughout all sections of Greenbelt, east, west, and center, um, to pr collect materials and then um, kind of provide them into the compost systems as like a one-year pilot. Um, so this is something that interests you. You want to start collecting food waste, um, but you don't necessarily have a compost bin yet. Um, feel free to contact me. I have my contact up there, and I will connect you to those project leads. Um, we're interested in having families through all, all of Greenbelt, so definitely get involved with this So this is something that interests you. Yeah, so the idea with that is you would collect your food scraps in some kind of buckety system and then um, take it to the one of the Three Sisters Gardens. There's one in Spring Hill Lake, there's one at the Community Center, and there's one at Trump Hills Park. And then uh, with Cheers, uh, you would compost your stuff at one of those three compost bins, so you don't have to have your own compost pile at home. Yep, so great project. Contact me if you're at all interested in having that be part of um, your composting needs. Um, so that's all of the information I have. I'm going to get to questions in a second, but I really wanted to thank everyone for coming out today, and I hope you got something out of this workshop. <laughs>